Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Josiah. It's a pleasure to be here with you this evening. Some of our closest neighbours, the Pacific Island states of Tuvalu and Kiribati, will be completely submerged beneath the ocean in less than 50 years. Sydney is at the risk of the same fate. It's a sobering thought. Climate change and the human rights impacts of global warming on people is a major challenge facing humanity. Increasingly, we're seeing climate change litigation emerging as a tool to drive change in corporate behavior and encourage a rapid transition from reliance on fossil fuels to low carbon economies. Climate change is now being framed as a human rights emergency. It has evident potential to cause extreme harm to communities around the world. The Philippines National Human Rights Institution is preparing to take action against 47 of the world's carbon majors, including Australian mining giant BHP, for their role in causing a rise in temperatures, which in turn created the conditions for devastating Typhoon Haiyan. Haiyan hit the Philippines in 2003 and left 7,000 people dead. A major legal action is also underway in the US where Californian communities have filed a claim against 37 oil, gas and coal companies claiming that they knew their products would cause a rise in sea levels but that they failed to cut their greenhouse gas emissions. What's unclear to us at this stage is the extent to which companies will ultimately be held responsible for climate change and its impact on people. What is clear to us is the imperative for humanity to cooperate globally on this and other contemporary challenges that we're facing today, such as the rise of nationalist aggression and growing inequality in our international systems of production and supply. Incredibly, the world's eight richest people hold the same amount of wealth as the world's poorest 50%. What is also clear to us is that the role of business in addressing these challenges will be key. As part of the problem, business very much needs to be part of the solution. Global cooperation through legal avenues represents a critical mechanism for regulating corporate human rights performance and tackling related challenges. Businesses must adopt a proactive and responsible approach to human rights, both within their home countries and when operating overseas. But how to achieve this? Firstly, through law. This is a fundamental mechanism for driving greater respect for human rights in business. But what are human rights and how exactly do they relate to business? Human rights are basic freedoms and protections that belong to all individuals. They promote the values of dignity, respect, quality, equality and fairness. Human rights as a concept developed in the aftermath of the Second World War and reflected a desire to avoid a repeat of the atrocities of the Holocaust. They represent fundamental individual rights that are enshrined in international law, most notably the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and subsequent covenants on civil and political rights and economic, social and cultural rights, as well as ILO and OECD instruments. Human rights treaties contain state obligations which are then translated into domestic law and apply nationally. Examples of laws in Australia which contain human rights protections are our suite of anti-discrimination acts, the Privacy Act, National um, Native Title Act and consumer protection laws. Responsibility for protecting human rights has traditionally belonged to the state, with international human rights law providing the framework for protecting individuals from the abuse of government power. 
This view has, however, undergone a significant revision in recent times, and increasingly companies too are perceived as having their own human rights responsibilities. So how are human rights relevant to business? The term business and human rights refers to a way of viewing economic activity that applies a human rights lens to business practices and impacts. It looks at how business affects human rights and how to prevent business from causing harm to people. Not only their employees and those directly connected with companies, but also others affected by a company's operations, such as local communities and those impacted via supply chains. Yes, business and human rights involves international law, but it's not just about international law. It impacts on almost every aspect of our daily lives, from the clothes we wear to the food we eat and the electronic devices we carry in our pockets. It is relevant to all commercial sectors. It's relevant to all companies, to those operating at home and those with overseas subsidiaries. Examples of key human rights that are commonly impacted by business include the rights to life and physical security, freedom from discrimination, and freedom from slavery, child labor, and forced labor. These issues are very high on the public agenda in Australia at the moment. In this year's Australia Day Honours List, Andrew Forrest was appointed an Officer of the Order of Australia in no small part due to his efforts to eradicate uh, modern slavery from corporate supply chains. We are seeing modern slavery attracting increased scrutiny in the media. Recently, it was the turn of Domino's Pizza but also 7-Eleven and Rip Curl have been in the spotlight. The Australian government, as we've heard, is considering introducing a modern slavery act um, or reporting requirement which will require companies to report annually on the steps that they're taking to address the existence of modern slavery both in their own operations and also throughout their supply chains. Josiah mentioned the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. These are the UN obligations that set out the responsibilities of business with respect to human rights. As their name suggests, they provide guidance for business. They were unanimously endorsed in 2011 by the UN Human Rights Council, with Australia co-sponsoring the resolution. They represent a global standard for preventing and addressing the negative human rights impacts of business. So what do they say? The overriding principle contained within the guiding principles is that business has a responsibility to respect human rights. That means that companies must act with due diligence and avoid infringing on the rights of others and address adverse impacts with which they are involved. The guiding principles also provide concrete steps for businesses to follow in order to comply with the guiding principles. These requirements involve having a human rights policy, establishing due diligence processes, reporting on human rights matters, and remediating harm. The guiding principles establish a know and show framework. Companies must know what their actual or potential human rights impacts are, and they must be able to show via public disclosure how they are addressing them. The UN guiding principles are highly significant. They're viewed as the main game in town, representing globally accepted terms of business. Since 2011, they've been taken up in national policy and legal measures, such as national action plans on business and human rights and modern slavery acts, two measures that are currently under consideration by the Australian government and on which I and others have spent a great deal of time over the last couple of years. The guiding principles have been incorporated into company policies and practices, commercial contract provisions, and international business guidelines. 
Financing conditions may stipulate that companies comply with the UN guiding principles. They have been highly influential in generating awareness and shaping how companies approach human rights. And yet, human rights abuses linked to corporate activities continue to occur. There are regular media reports of migrant <coughs> workers, often from Pacific Island nations, being exploited on Australian farms, sometimes those supplying our large supermarket chains. There are also regular instances of abuse occurring overseas. In 2013, in Bangladesh, a 13-storey garment factory called Rana Plaza collapsed, killing over 1,100 workers and injuring many more. A rash of suicides in 2014 and 2015 at Foxconn in China, which was making Apple products, put the spotlight on the conditions of workers making iPhones. In 2014 in Brazil, a mine tailings dam burst at a site operated by Samarco, BHP's joint venture with Vale, the Brazilian mining giant. This released a torrent of water and mud that engulfed the local town of Bente Rodriguez, killing 19 of its inhabitants. We're also seeing the operations of loggers and miners in vulnerable Pacific states, such as the Solomon Islands and PNG, begin to attract greater attention and come into focus. Business and human rights issues commonly arising in these countries relate to mining in the absence of adequate local consent, or non-payment of royalties to local people, or instances of severe environmental pollution causing widespread damage to livelihoods and lands. The fact that human rights abuses continue to be committed by companies demonstrates that the existing legal framework, be that international legal instruments or national legislation, does have its limits in preventing irresponsible corporate behaviour. Attempts at holding companies to account through the courts, um, commonly using the tort of negligence, are notoriously difficult, lengthy, costly and unreliable as a mechanism for achieving redress for victims. Cases can take decades to proceed through the court systems and complainants often die well before any compensation award can be made. <coughs> the limits of courts in achieving justice for business and human rights victims in these large and highly complex legal cases, often involving hundreds of litigants, are well documented. Barriers to justice for business and human rights litigants are numerous. They exist in the form of financial constraints, the procedural and practical hurdles associated with jurisdiction of the courts or evidence gathering, as well as the legal limitations on parent company liability. These hurdles, coupled with the absence of enforcement mechanisms in existing instruments such as the UN guiding principles, has produced a significant governance gap. Many large international companies operate globally and have incredible influence and reach. OECD, OECD figures show that of the world's top 100 economies, 51 of these are actually <coughs> companies rather than countries. However, international businesses are not regulated globally with respect to human rights, and accountability is limited. Whilst the development of a business and human rights treaty offers one potential solution to this challenge, the treaty process has suffered from a lack of political appetite in Western nations, which is where most large internationals are domiciled. One can only imagine that that appetite will be further diminished in this brave new world of Trump and Brexit. So what other levers can we use to drive corporate human rights compliance? The answer to that is that there are many. The rich content of this current issue of the Law Journal reflects this. It includes articles examining drivers that exist in domestic criminal legislation, 
in multi-stakeholder initiatives, and it also looks at the role of trade unions in countries of production, such as Cambodia, Vietnam, and Bangladesh. There are many other levers, investor scrutiny, employee expectations, public procurement incentives, consumer advocacy, exposure in the media, non-judicial complaints mechanisms, ample subject matter for future issues. Before finishing, I'd like to take a few minutes to consider another critical mechanism for encouraging more responsible business, and that is information. Using information to encourage improvements in corporate human rights performance through greater transparency, scrutiny and accountability is the focus of my work at the Resource Centre. If we know what companies are saying they do and make this public, then there's greater accountability when these standards are not met. For those of you unfamiliar with the Business and Human Rights Resource Centre, we're a global human rights organisation that works to advance respect for human rights in business. We're excited to have recently launched in this region with me as the first representative covering Australia, New Zealand and the Pacific. We have 17 regional representatives and researchers who track the human rights performance of companies worldwide and report publicly on their impacts. This information is made available on our website and in our free weekly update. Uh, if you haven't already subscribed for the weekly update, I would encourage you to do so. Um, and if you are already a subscriber, I, I hope that you uh, recognise what a valuable resource the centre is. We also take up allegations quickly and directly with companies and ask them to respond on specific human rights allegations. And we make these responses publicly available. If there are allegations against an Australian miner operating in Senegal, I will contact their headquarters here in Australia and invite comment. Sometimes our response process leads to immediate positive changes in company policy and practices. In others, it leads to dialogue opening up between the company and those raising the allegations of abuse. In all cases, it increases transparency and enhances accountability and provides information to those that need it. An example of how effectively this information can be used to create change is in when the example of when we drew attention to what was happening with Syrian garment workers um, in Turkish factories. Following reports of serious exploitation of refugees, we reached out to the brands involved with questions on how they were dealing with their supply chain issues. We then released a report of the responses we received and this drew significant media interest. In the days following the release of this report, many of the companies involved signed on to a child labour remediation programme and others announced immediate measures such as on-the-ground factory checks. Local campaigners have told us that since our report, the brands involved have been galvanised into action. It's clear that law is critical in achieving respect for human rights in business, both through the application of legal rules governing company behaviour, as well as through the enforcement mechanism of the courts. However, law does have its limits as an effective tool for encouraging business respect for human rights. These limits arise from the fact that much of the economic activity in today's global world, globalised world, occurs via international operations that are conducted in the absence of international regulation on human rights. We've witnessed the failings of corporate voluntarism to embed a respect for human rights in business through company codes and other self-regulatory measures. In the absence of a binding international treaty on business and human rights, civil society continues to play a critical role in regulating corporate activity 
by closely scrutinizing the human rights performance of companies and making this information publicly available, by pointing out where companies are falling short on human rights and calling for action when they do. Through knowledge and an understanding of the challenges we face, we're better equipped to identify the steps needed to achieve more responsible business that embeds a respect for the human rights of all. This is vital if we hope to succeed in addressing contemporary challenges such as the threat, uh, the threat that we are facing from climate change and growing global inequality. Law is a critical part of that journey. Thank you.